My name is Denise Ferris and I'm currently the head of the School of Art at ANU and uh, I welcome uh, people who are visiting um, us tonight and of course warmly welcome all of my colleagues. <coughs> Anthea Callan was, until June 2014, the Professor of Art, practice-led research in the School of Art. First arriving here at the school in 2010 as a visiting professor in painting. She is also Professor Emeritus of Visual Culture at the University of Nottingham. So, strictly speaking, Professor Callan is not, as I pre previously described her, our professor, but is in fact uh, and will be our Emeritus Professor. <coughs> We're not travelling, Anthea lives and works in Lyndington Spa in the UK and in the south of France. Good on her. <laughs> Anthea Cullen is a scholar and a painter. Her expertise in art history, visual culture and the gender politics of visual representation spans the 18th to the 20th centuries, notably in France and Britain. Her research specialisation in 19th century artists' materials and techniques means she works regularly with museum conservators and curators. As a painter, she has a strong personal as well as a professional interest in the 20th century, in 20th century modernism and contemporary art, especially feminist and women's art practice. Anthea Cullen trained as a painter and printmaker at Birmingham College of Art and Design, now Birmingham City University in the UK. She went on to study and establish a career in art history and visual culture while maintaining her art practice. She is a painter whose primary interest is in the human figure and its form. She studied, studied through drawing and colour using a wide range of mixed media from oils to pastels and inks. Most recently, Anthea delivered a lecture in the Symbolising Death session on the 20th of September, last weekend, at the highly successful Art and Motelli Symposium organised by Professor Helen Innes, the Centre for Art History and Art Theory at the School of Art. <coughs> the insight that Anthea's paper, Death and the Surgeon's Art, left from me was the similarity in the way surgeons and artists may approach an understanding of the body as a subject. Anthea remarked, and I wildly paraphrase here, so forgive, prof. The plurosensorial gaze is definitely not the gaze of the flaneur, which is a touch or seeing or knowing kind of gaze. Rather, the plurosensorial gaze is filled with all the senses taking on other forms of knowledge, including touch, smell, as well as seeing. Touch, seeing, plurosensorial, multi-sensory, is the medical and the artist's gaze. In the audience, you can readily imagine why Anthea's association with us, with the School of Art, and with the practitioners at the School of Art, has been so incredibly invaluable. Anthea Cullen has studied artistic anatomy as well as formal life drawing of the human figure, and this interest clearly crosses over into her art history work, where she researches the historical use of anatomical study in art, as well as artist training in the discipline. Her upcoming book is The Work of Art, Plain Air Painting and Artistic Identity in 19th Century France. I ask you to uh, welcome Anthea in her lecture this evening. Wow. <laughs> what a fantastic welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this in the right place? I'm so mic'd up, I can't believe it. I'm going to have these attachments all over me. Ooh. 
Okay, what I'm talking about today isn't anything to do with art and death, but in fact there are very real parallels because what I tr I tr I'm trying to do with both is to kind of pull back from the intellectual into the actual material of practice. So I was trying to do that in the art and mortality paper and called The Surgeon's Art, and in this paper, I'm, I'm also trying to do that. So to locate very specifically the ideas and arguments within a material, a very material practice. And uh, let's see how it goes. I'm actually starting with a, a rather delightful quote. This is the, actually I should say, I've divided this talk into two parts. Context. Which kind of lays out the ideas and arguments, and then a, a, a brief case study. Okay, picture. The first context picture. Here's my delightful quote. It's from um, a theoretician called Jean Pierre Thénault, uh, or Thénault, as we probably say in French. The Cours Complet de Paysage from 1834, page 5. I'm giving you it in English. <laughs> it's hard for anyone who has never drawn or painted from nature to have a fair idea of the interest the artist experiences when choosing, or rather, ardently seizing a well-lit view enriched with happy accidents, he prepares to make the portrait. From the first moment he readies his crayons and brushes, he readily sees, he already sees, the enterprise completed according to his desires. With each mark grows a pleasure made all the more intense by the difficulties he suffers, the resistances nature seems to offer to his eagerness the efforts he redoubles to seize her, his pleasures, finally, at each favor he obtains. And it's really actually important that the, 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 the word that Thénault uses for this is the French word jouissance, which actually also means orgasm. Ah, you wouldn't have guessed, would you? <laughs> so that kind of lays the, the groundwork for what I want to try and say today. The great era of French plein air, plein air landscape painting that my uh, book that is just complete considers spans the long 19th century, beginning with artists in Rome in the 1780s and effectively closing in Paris with the advent of Cubism. Standard practice for all French landscape painters from 1817 onwards Plein air painting became widespread and highly visible. Ta da! Can you see it clearly enough? Artist plus female muse, of course. She's not actually painting. She's in this kind of nice, flouncy white dress. She's a sort of both a metaphor and a, an actual embodied personage accompanying the artist en plein air. This is by a painter called François Francais and dates from 1847, I think. And interestingly, it's called Les Artistes Contempor Contemporains. So it literally means the latest trend. Already common during the 1820s, plein air painting was ubiquitous by the 1840s when the railways began to make travel easier. By the 1850s, landscape painting was the most popular of all genre in France, both as exhibits at the, at the Paris Salon and among dealers and collectors. Perhaps it's no coincidence that the radical plein air painting now associated with the Impressionists in the 1870s, in fact had its origins in the period immediately before the French Revolution of 1789. The work of art, what I'm writing about, explores the continuities and changes in methods and materials of landscape painting over the century and its role in the formation of modern artistic identity. 
I'm interested in the concept of the work of art. How do particular kinds of painting practice denote different ideas of labor in the material processes of art, rather than just in its imagery and its, in its iconography? Why did this issue become especially important during the 19th century when the moder modernity of an artwork could be found in artist's material practice, the physical processes of painting that became simultaneously the subject, its subject and its object, the work of art. What I want to argue, what I argue in my book, is that it's the work of plein air painters and the changes their practices affected that so in the work of plein air painters and the changes their practices affected that the real innovations in painting were generated. In terms of modern artis artistic identity, truth to the self, and the new attention to relations between making and meaning. And since artists always refer as much to each other's work and to past art as to external nature, this is not inevitably a question of progress, but also one of continuity. And I'm showing you this delightful image of Daumier's idea of the landscape painter in the mid-1860s. So this is the point I'm making here, that art is a, as much about other art and other artists as it is about looking outward into nature. Labor in the work of art became, in 19th century France, a key factor for artists, critics, and collectors alike. Whether they were for or against the idea of visible mark making, or facture, as, as it's called in French, the aesthetics of finish or unfinished were central in artistic debates and avant-garde practice in the period. In my book, I argue that landscape painting in general and plein air oil studies in particular were key drivers of change in artistic practice in the period, which culminated, it didn't start with, it culminated in Impressionism and post-Impressionism and the birth of modernism. The concepts of work I address include not just the act of painting, but the materials, tools, and methods of making, facture in the work of art itself, as well as ideas about the work of painter embodied in the appearance and persona, the performance of painting, and the painted objects. So I'm trying to bring all those components together. Almost all the work in my book is by men. The main exception being Bert Morisot. <coughs> this is a rather monochrome version of this painting. It actually is much more colorful. It's the crap Musée d'Orsay website, which is to blame here. Um, but for me, this is one of the most sensational portraits ever painted. It's just extraordinary. Anyway, this is Bert Morisot painted by Manet, um, 1869, 17. So the exception that I'm flagging up is Bert Morisot, the only woman plein air impressionist who is now finally accorded equivalent status to her male colleagues. Though it would be actually interesting to do a study of, of, of sale room prices, because I suspect that Morisot's work still, still sells more cheaply than you know, your Monet and your, well, Cezanne and whatever. But you know, in terms of scholarly attention, it's, it's much more equivalent now. In the book, I therefore focus primarily on male agency in 19th century landscape art and the reasons for it. How did modernism come to be defined by the early 20th century as a predominantly masculine domain? 
In terms of gender, the question of modern artistic identity is particularly interesting, given that during the later 18th century, the later 18th century, women artists actually began to gain a serious new eminence. Whether Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, here in a self-portrait with her equipment, Um, whether Vigée Lebrun, her portrait dates, the self-portrait dates from 1782. This is actually a variant of the original that she made herself in France, or your Angelica Kaufman in Britain. Despite their educational constraints and lack of access to the nude life model, Many privately trained and sought after women artists flourished in this late 18th century period. However, in the 19th century, consolidation of bourgeois society <coughs> and its ideologies of femininity <coughs> and the growing identification of women with domesticity, women artists became further restricted. For example, to appropriate media feminine pastel and watercolour, rather than manly oils, and to lowly subject matter, <clears throat> such as children, portraits, flowers, and interiors. In France, this trend actually came slightly later than in England, so that the exclusion of women uh, from the workplace, or gendered spheres of, of life, as it came to be called, um, despite its inscription, in the Napoleonic Code Civile in 1804, in practice, did not wholly take effect in France until the Second Empire. So that's after um, the 1848 revolution. The professionalization of women artists between 1800 and 1850 in France came actually in the context of a lowering of the mean social class of artists of both sexes and a rapid expansion in the overall number of professional artists. So, you know, if it becomes a common trade, women are allowed in, basically. It's been argued that the radical independent art movements of the 19th century championed the genres lower down the academic hi hierarchy, which in turn gave women painters greater involvement and prestige. Yet from the outset, landscape painting and the theories that underpinned it meant prohibitions for women comparable to those of studying from the nude. In both ideology and practice, the new plenarism enabled male painters to carve out an almost exclusively masculine territory. Whether amateur or professional, women artists required chaperoning and were thus restricted very frequently to work in the home, in the garden, or in their own private studio. A small number of images before 1850, <clears throat> like this very early Corbet from the mid-1840s, include a female artist. But in reality, the social constraints on movement imposed by their middle or upper middle class or upper class status ensured women artists' marginalization on the terrain of the outdoor male painter. Around 1800, the all but obligatory Italian sojourn for aspiring European artists was impractical for most women while the difficulties entailed in traveling around France itself were problematic as well. In an era of growing fe female artistic ambition, therefore, plein air was a woman-free zone that marked the field as indisputably masculine. It is clear from Daumier's caricatures, we've had one already, but this one is a, these two, this pair, uh, which are from the 1840s rather than the 1860s. So taking the whole thing back um, that, you know, generation earlier almost, um, show landscape painters hiking, as you can see, hiking 
intrepidly in mountainous terrain, looking, it, I've said here, a sympathetic, for a sympathetic sight. Um, in fact, the caption has them saying, you know, where's the nearest sympathetic tavern where I can get a 12-egg omelette and a pint of, you know, Guinness, whatever. Um, so it's actually, um, you know, they're not even looking for a good motif. They're looking for a good pub at this point. Um, and the one on the right-hand side, which is, um, which is captioned, looking for a forest in Champagne. I mean, there are forests in Champagne, <laughs> but, you know, not as many as you'd find in the, in the Jura, for example. Um, and the, and the coloured version of this, there's a wonderful tinted version of this, which I hadn't got a slide of for you. And actually, this guy at the back, they're, they're totally wrongly dressed for what they're doing. They're wearing city clothes, you know, checks and fancy trousers. And the, the, what they're walking through here is mud. And, the, you know, they've got sort of mud all over their feet. Um, so it, it kind of contextualises that. It, clearly, they don't know their arse from their elbow, basically, and they're kind of traipsing around the countryside not knowing where to look for a good motif. Okay. So you can imagine in this context just how challenging it would have been for women in their crinolines or, you know, even whatever, manoeuvring up mountains and, and up and down hills and through the mud. So, hence, working in gardens is quite a good idea. Also, the potential <coughs> isolation, dangers, physical rigors, and endurance associated with work outdoors in all weathers, at all times of the day and year, permitted male artists to carve out this identity akin to their brother colonizers of the new worlds. Rugged adventurers, conquering new terrains, which you can also read, of course, as raw female nature. So I think there's a real parallel here with, with actually um, colonizing activities that are going on throughout this period as well. Further, from around 1850, the swaggering masculinity that Corbet affected, and here I'm showing you his meeting with his patron, Bruyas from 1854, and the masterly virility of his painting technique stamped this persona onto the landscape, again as female nature to be tamed, in ways that only color with its feminine association, could hope to modify with the rise of Impressionism. Yet even this was vexed. The male appropriation of landscape, of color, and of matière, the messy paint materials that had a feminine as well as a manual artisan association, that Impressionism was trying to take over for itself, that male appropriation proved a mixed blessing for women painters like Morisot, whose work was, in fact, consistently stereotyped as feminine. So, I mean, it's kind of double bind there. Oh, I've got a slide of, of her work. Mm -hmm. This is a, um, a little oil study of the harbor in Nice uh, from 1882. Gorgeous. Of course, the identities under review here are also explicitly classed as well as gendered. The worker painter was in fact rarely working class as such, although many of the artists involved in what became called the petit maître of landscape painter, the small masters, never mind the big masters like Courbet, the small masters of landscape painting, um, were often from humble or artisanal beginnings. The career of artist itself was only in the process of professionalizing during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, having previously been a craft practice associated with skilled manual labor, involving, as it did, dirty hands and traditional craft skills. 
Indeed, for the emerging professional artist, distinguishing the cerebral from the physical was one of the key ideological functions of the Paris Academy, which taught and regulated the fine arts and its highest genre, history painting, where the idea was preeminent and the mark of the maker, the sign of handcrafting, was all but effaced. Yet with the rise of republicanism and democracy in France, many artists sought to reclaim, celebrate, and identify with the very, that very craft and the guild heritage from which their immediate forebears in the academy had sought to distance themselves. So, for example, in 1873, the proto-impressionists established their anonymous cooperative exhibiting society based on the charter of a baker's union in Pizarro's home village of Pontoise. So this was symptomatic of the new democratizing tendency and its associated artisanal traditions. The quest of a craft identity, however, was also more vexed for women than for men in the 19th century. It was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it was a label deployed to sideline women's achievement as actual crafts professionals, for example, in weaving, pottery, and needlework, within creative sec sectors where a sexual division of labor reigned. On the other hand, for the woman painter, the label was a means to downgrade her status as a fine artist. In a period when later ladies' artistic accomplishments were burgeoning and highly valued among the middle classes, so in other words, as amateurs, to the ambitious, ambitious professional woman, therefore, the craft label smacked of amateurism rather than skill. The masculine artist worker identities elaborated in my book involved a complex play then across the boundaries of class that for women artists further troubled already compromised their already compromised position as aspiring art professionals. This was an era when ladies did not work. And the term working women, at least in 1848 after uh, the pa after the, the revolution in, of 1848 in Paris, was synonymous with loose morals and prostitution. So to be called a working woman meant, you know, you were a streetwalker. The unconventional life of realist and animal landscape painter Rosa Bonner demonstrates the difficulties faced by ambitious women artists at mid-century. In order to prepare for her monumental paintings of animals. This is 16 feet long, this painting, by eight feet high. In order to prepare for works like this, which dates from 1855, in fact, um, she visited horse traders and slaughterhouses in Paris to undertake the relevant anatomical study. To do this, she had to gain special dispensation from the French police to wear trousers and a smock in public. In other words, she had to adopt a male persona in order to gauge, engage in the research necessary for her practice. And it, I think it may be significant, too, that actually her work is more appreciated outside France um, because I mean, it's so virile, this work. It's extraordinary. Um, but they loved it in Britain, and they loved it in the States. This is in uh, the Met in uh, New York. Whereas in France, they were probably just a bit saying, oh, God, why didn't she put a skirt on? <coughs> By the 1860s, some women ventured outdoors to paint, and on their teacher Camille Corot's advice, Bette Morisot and her sister Edma, who gave up painting when she married, which was the more frequent course than, than Bette Morisot's case, they executed studies together on plein air, which really can be dated to their first expeditions to uh, the uh, mid-1860s. 
Morisot also painted landscapes viewed from indoors and in gardens. Gardens, of course, are a, a, like a private extension of the domestic space. They are effectively um, landscaped domestic spaces. But Morisot was exemplary in continuing throughout her life to make plein air oil studies and watercolors, whether in the Parisian suburbs or on holidays in England, Normandy, and the Côte d'Azur. Okay, so now I'm going to... Oh, I, I, I'm going to take you now into the laundry. Having laid a kind of framework for thinking about Morisot and thinking about landscape painting and plein air painting, I'm now going to just do a brief um, case study around the idea of, of laundry and laundresses. In the form of naturalist genre painting, laundry and laundresses had been a popular eroticized subject with semi-clad working women kneeling and leaning forwards in their labors and generally dealing with intimate apparel. With from as early as Chardin and Hubert Robert in the 18th century through to the more skeptical mid-19th century realists like Jean-Francois Millet or Camille Pizarro himself, one of the uh, impressionists. Landscapists like Corot and Daubigny here, Daubigny, locate laundering, you have to look really hard, locate laundering on rural riverbanks Yet at times they're so discreetly placed that the laboring fi figures are almost impossible to see. Urban realists, do you want me to show you where they are? We get a prize for knowing. <laughs> Sometimes you get more of a, a red accent to kind of locate them, kind of coro esque red accent, but not always. Urban realists, on the other hand, confronted this women's labor directly in the claustrophobic confines of Parisian basements, which Gordon's going to be looking in detail at very shortly. Degas' highly skilled ironers are a really interesting example. Very immediate, direct, cropped, close, confrontational images of, uh, of ironers, but I should emphasize the work that these women are doing. It's the highly skilled end of the trade. This isn't the, you know, mm, in the river. This is proper, they're, they're right at the top of the, of the hierarchy, if you like, of the laundry trades. So the scale and cropping of figures like those of Dugas within these compositions make the brutal reality of their labor unavoidable. However, Kaibot's riverside composition, here, laundry drying, at Petit Genevilliers, and it's actually opposite Argenteuil on the Seine, just uh, um, kind of west of, of Paris. Kaibot's riverside composition reveals laundry as a suburban hard labor. Bloody hell, look at that. Despite the sunny gaiety of the setting, the hundreds of identical whites, what are they? Linen? Shirts? Chef's whites? Shows the enforced, oh no, hang on, that's the wrong line. Signal an enterprise on an industrial scale. This is industrial laundry here. Although what we have in fact is the wash boats here moored to the side of the Seine at which this laundry was, was executed and then hung to dry on the bank. No buxom laundresses here to humanize or eroticize the drudgery. Within the enclosed confines of Manet's Argenteuil garden, his laundress shows the enforced intimacy of domestic service. In hanging laundry, 
However, Bert Morisot draws back. Her elevated viewpoint reveals an almost rural landscape. We have here a sense of not just, I think, distance, though. I think we have the painter taking greater control of what she sees. Almost a rural landscape, yet the distant chimneys of Paris factories counterpoint the very material reality in the immediate foreground of the manual drudgery entailed in women's labor, in the laundry trades. And I think this is Poissy, again a, a suburb of, uh, of Paris where she frequently stayed. So although herself distanced from domestic work by her class and her profession, she nevertheless draws a parallel between this women's labor and her own as a painter. And this is where I'm trying to argue the way in which the artist, and I can, I've, I've talked in the book about, about the Manet and the Kaibot in this context as well, but differently, the way in which she's using as a metaphor, the women's labor for the labor that she's doing. The small scale and lively immediacy of Morisot's study suggests that it was rapidly executed, probably in a single sitting. High key in palette, it was painted on a canvas primed off-white, which plays a crucial role both in the picture's overall luminosity and as highlights amongst the applied colors. Such broken touches of color and a sketchy facture, the handling, were all associated with capturing the effect, with directness, spontaneity, and truth to the artist's personal sensations in front of nature, but also to their work as artists in rendering it. So what Kaibot represents is a more impersonal view of anonymous women's physical labor. There are no figures. Where Manet, po Manet used a posed figure in painting his laundry, it points up in contrast the non-figurative element of Kaibot's approach, anti-narrative in his choice of subject matter. Here, the energetic movement he, he represents of the wind in drying linen would not exist in duration. Each second, the scene would change. So what Kaibot in the 1890s shows us of women's labor, unlike his own large-scale figure paintings of skilled male artisans in the, male artisans in the 1870s, this monumental, uh, it's actually, I mean, the painting is actually more or less the same size. In fact, I think the laundry drawing might be even slightly bigger than this. Um, the, the kind of monumental, monumentality he gives to the male body, he just defaces the woman worker in the laundry trades. This is the floor scrapers from 1875. What we have instead, sorry, I'm going to go back to that one. What we have instead in this Kaibot laundry drying is only the traces of hard manual labor, the clean linen. These traces are simultaneously records of the painter's and the laundress's work. These traces are rendered visible in solid, heavy, crusty paint buildup layered over time, a record not just of, of, uh, of the paint application and the artist's work, but it's just like the washerwomen's time-consuming work made visible stretching out along the line. Kaibot's marks represent the linen built up over time, and his repeated rhythmic strokes across the canvas echo the laundress's wooden bats beating the linen in flaying the dirt out. So in his act of painting, the marks both mimic and represent the work of mass washing, 
yet without the female presence crucial to the intimacy of Morisot's painting. In Morisot's hanging laundry, the women's work explicitly retains its association with domestic drudgery and with the mark of its woman maker. Her labor as an artist mirrors the labors of the women she represents. Thank you. <laughs>